Well, I encourage you to turn in your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 6. It's good to be with you all this morning as we continue our study in the book of Ephesians. Um, Specifically this morning, we're going to continue our study in the armor of God as we near the end of our book, which we actually began back in March, um, which has been a wonderful, fruitful long study. I hope that you've, you've, learnt, you've learned much, you've been encouraged much. Um, and right now, as we walk through uh, the armor of God, what we've really been seeking to do is walk slowly through the applications and instructions here. Uh, last week, as we looked at verses 10 through 13 in our study, Paul showed us, first of all, that our strength is really not our strength at all. In fact, he showed us that we cannot be self-sufficient. We must be Savior-sufficient. This is why in verse 10 he said, Be strong in the Lord. And again, the apostle continued by calling us to put on the full armor of God. Now we learned that this was because we have already put on Christ. And so we may now put on God's armor because he has taken off our filthy garments and clothed us in Christ's garments of righteousness. And so the reason we are to then put on this armor, as Paul says in verse 11, is so that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now understand, we have a very real enemy. Uh, I mentioned last week how our culture loves to downplay that fact loves to uh, almost to really put Satan into a picture where he seems harmless. Uh, but he is deceitful and he wants to destroy us. Scripture is in fact clear on that fact. And even as I mentioned in our time last week, the devil would love for us to just continually be in a joyless, defeated state. Satan would love for Christians to just be in that space where we neglect the means of grace that God has given, uh, neglecting prayer and the ministry of the word and the ordinances and and even the the gathering and the fellowship of the saints. And and so really in his goal and in his aim, it's really to see us remain in a place of spiritual depression and self-denial. But again, throughout this study, What we need to remember is that God wants to fix our eyes upon Christ. That's the most important reality in this section. It's a call for saints to be faithful. Because again, our enemy would love nothing more than to distract or destroy our faith and even entice us to think the best thing for us is just to walk away from the Lord. And so as Paul works his way through explaining and applying the armor of God, he does so with the ultimate focus on Christ Jesus himself. And so knowing this, what we're going to learn and apply in this exposition this morning of verses 13 through 15 is that we must take up God's armor that we may be able to stand and go forth in the gospel. If you're taking notes this morning, those are your fill in the blanks as we go to read Verses 13 through 15. And so hear the word of the Lord. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. And may God bless the reading of his holy and infallible word. Now in our time this morning, as we seek to even revisit verse 13, this verse is very similar to verse 11, uh, which shows how important this instruction is to the apostle. Uh, Again, previously in verse 11, Paul told us to put on the whole armor of God. And now, as we look again at verse 13 this week, he says, take up the whole armor of God. 
Now, again, I want you to really understand that Paul is telling us to take up what is ours in Christ. The armor is not something one earns with years of training. No, in fact, these things make up God's own armor given to his people that are in Christ. Again, as Paul said to the church in Rome, in Romans 13, verse 12, let us cast off the works of darkness and put on the armor of light. And in verse 14 of Romans 13, he said, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. And so in all of this, we are reminded in our text that God wants us to be equipped and clothed in Christ. But really, the Sunday school answer is sufficient for us this morning. The answer is Jesus. And so we're not even to be looking to our own strength. We're reminded from Ephesians chapter 1 that we are to look to the strength and power that is in Christ. Because as Paul tells us, that is what is now at work within us. The same power that raised Christ from the dead, God is using at work in believers. And so when Paul says in our text to put on or to take up this armor, he's speaking of applying what is already ours in Christ. That since we have been saved by grace and forgiven of our trespasses and sins and called to walk worthy of our calling, we may now put on God's own armor because he's taken off our filthy, sinful garments and he's clothed us in Christ's garments of righteousness. Again, this is why Paul said back in chapter 4, verse 24, put on the new self created after the likeness of God in true righteousness and holiness. And so again, ultimately... To take up the whole armor of God is to acknowledge what we have already put on in the Lord Jesus Christ. Now see, church, this should give us great hope and courage when we face the battles of this evil age. Because the Christian is not equipped and prepared in their own strength or in their own righteousness. No, the scriptures tell us we are created anew in Christ after the likeness of God in, the, in true righteousness and holiness. As Paul wrote in Galatians chapter 3, verse 27, he says, as many, as, as many of you as were baptized into Christ have put on Christ. Now, church, the beautiful truth of scripture here is that we have... Past tense, if we have believed upon Christ, we have put on Christ himself. Again, think of how important this is in Paul's application in Ephesians 6. In fact, think of this in the, in the illustration of a civilian and a soldier. A, a civilian thinks of his own affairs. He thinks of his own interests. And really, he has no concern for any battle to face or any certain posture to have. But a soldier is quite different. He's taken up that identity. Regardless if he is at work or at home, he does not imagine himself ceasing from being a soldier. And so this is what we should think of as we work our way through this passage. We're not to think of taking up the armor to become soldiers, to then put on Christ. No, we are soldiers. We are in Christ. If we have repented and believed upon the Lord Jesus Christ, then we have already put on Christ. But again, in this, let me ask you, are you living and acting and going about your life like a civilian or a soldier? Spiritually speaking, how do you approach the troubles of this life? How do you approach the conflicts the difficulties, are you living as a civilian with your own care or as a soldier who's put on the whole armor of God? See, the danger is that if we go about our life as these types of civilians of this world, 
then we will not be armed as soldiers who have put on Christ. And so this is why Paul gives us a command with urgency to take up the whole armor of God. Now again, in the second part of verse 13, Paul reminds us almost thematically why God gives us his armor in Christ. He says it's so that we may be able to withstand in the evil day. Now previously, Paul had told us in verse 11, it was so that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. And so church, remember, these two verses show us that in these evil days, the devil is our true enemy. I think it's so easy for us to often look upon one another and think just in the physical realm. We think of someone who's deeply annoyed us, deeply troubled us, and go, man, that feels like that is my real enemy. You hear it all the time, even in subtle ways within married couples, Even with our own children, we think, Lord, this is the enemy you have put in my life. But truly, Paul wants us to understand our true ultimate enemy is one we may not see, but is ultimately after our destruction. And so we need to remember, as Paul outlined in verse 12, we do not war against each other. Or even others who even will seek to harm our our body and cause us difficulty No, we war against an enemy that is after the destruction of our very souls. And so we need to be on guard that we would be able to withstand in the evil day. Now again, we also learned last week how the scriptures teach that until Christ returns, we are in this evil age and these evil days. Again, we should understand that, I believe, through the lens of Ephesians 1. Again, verse 21 tells us that Christ's rule and authority is not only in this age, but also in the one to come. And so even while we, were in, while we are in the flesh, in this evil age, we are not of this age. No, we are of the kingdom of the Son. We are in Christ. And so while we face a very real enemy who seeks whom he may devour, as Peter tells us, we are equipped with God's own armor that we may be able to withstand our enemy in these evil days. And so brothers and sisters, in that reality, we must be sober-minded. We need to be watchful. As we have put on Christ in his strength and mind, we must do everything everything possible to stand firm. Now, when Paul says in verse 13, having done all to stand firm, I find that to be a fascinating and challenging phrase. I mean, certainly the apostle does not mean that we are to do all in our strength. That would, in fact, contradict his words of verse 10 and much of his other writings. But what this does mean is that the Christian must not be lazy. The Christian cannot be complacent or passive. And so what we need to remember even in the midst of spiritual warfare, no soldier goes out alone. We need the body to stand firm. We must do all and do all together. Galatians 6 tells us to bear one another's burdens. James 5 tells us to call upon the elders to pray for them, to confess our sin to one another. And Hebrews 10 tells us to not forsake assembling together, even in suffering. And so even if we have to put ourselves in front of the church and be exposed in our weakness and our frailty, we must take our faith seriously. And as the Lord enables us in Christ, we need to seek to do all that we are able to do to stand firm. Again, notice how Paul continues in verse 14. He says, stand therefore. Now already in our study on God's armor, Paul has called us to stand four times. Now this is a call to a certain posture. Truly, if a soldier was to always sit or always lay around, it would be a clear evidence of some problem. Either he is injured, 
he is lazy or he's immature. He doesn't understand his post, his position, his enemy. And so as we think about this instruction in the Christian life, the reality, very sadly, is that there are many who claim to be Christians but are not standing. They may appear to us as being wise or being friendly or being present, but we find even in short amounts of time that they do not stand. It's either exposed that they are lazy in their faith, they're immature in their understanding of God's word, and even often they're easily moved by any type of teaching that seems popular. And so sadly in that, what the scriptures tell us is that many of those go off and depart from the faith. They become apostate. And so Paul's instructions and applications here are crucial for us to stand firm. Why? Because we are believers at war. Understand, we are no longer the sinners of Ephesians 2.2. We are no longer those who are dead in our trespasses and sins, following the prince of the power of the air. We are the saints of Ephesians 2, verse 4 through 8. And so the reality is that spiritual warfare is among us, and it is in us, not outside of us. And really, this is because we have been delivered from the dominion of the evil one. As Paul tells us in Colossians 1, we have been transferred to the kingdom of his own son. And so in this battle against this other dominion and the devil, we must seek to stand firm. We need to submit to God and trust in him. We need to remember and be reminded constantly that we have put on Christ. And we need to trust and rely upon the spirit. See, this is why right before Paul now lists this armor, he's telling us to stand firm and be on guard. But again, I want you to understand that as Paul is instructing us to stand firm, he is not saying that we are called to stand in our own strength. That's not what enables us to take up the armor of God and walk into battle. No, God wants us to fix our eyes on Christ. Paul is instructing us that we would be strong and stand in the Lord. And so we look to the strength and power that is in Christ. And so really, as we work through the elements of the armor, we need to understand that every word in this passage should remind us that this is the gracious and sovereign provision of God. These are not things of which we just take up when we choose or when we feel Ready to? No, these are the gracious and sovereign provisions of God of which he is giving himself. And so again, not to discourage us, but to show us the reality of our own weakness, we need to remember we are not strong. We cannot resist the devil. We do not naturally know we are at war against him. And we cannot stand on our own, but by the grace of God in Christ Jesus. And so that is how we have now come to put on the full armor of God, as Paul begins to describe in the following verse. Now, as, as we look at verse 14, I want you to understand that first, we need to think about these things in light of the scriptures, really in light of the Old Testament scriptures. And second, then, we can think of them in light of Paul's language that, that often points to the reality of his context of understanding Roman soldiers. Uh, personally, I do not believe that Paul is using the language and imagery of armor because he wants to have our minds on a Roman soldier. I don't think that's his primary focus. Rather, I think he wants to fix our minds upon Christ. And so I think that is the order of his focus. And this seems especially true considering Paul was, as he said in Philippians 3, 5, of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, and as to the law, a Pharisee. Paul knew the Old Testament scriptures. 
And so that was always his first focus in writing and applying the whole counsel of God in the life of the Christian. But also in his immediate context, we can understand. Remember, Paul is writing from prison. Paul is writing to the churches in Ephesus from prison where he is in chains under the watch of Roman soldiers standing guard. And so there is a context in which we do see Paul understanding these things as they would be physically applied in Roman soldiers. But ultimately, we need to understand Paul desires for our minds to be fixed upon Christ. And so that's really how we should consider the application of these messianic elements and these pieces of armor. And so look at verse 14 in your Bibles. As Paul told us to stand, he continues by saying, having fastened on the belt of truth. Now, if you have an NASB translation, you may see my point here, uh, that our minds should first be fixed upon God rather than a Roman soldier. See, in the NASB, most of verses 14 and 15 are in all caps. And this is because Paul is quoting the Old Testament directly. Uh, specifically in reference to the belt of truth. Paul is pointing back to Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5. And in verse 5 of Isaiah 11, it says, Righteousness shall be the belt of his waist, and faithfulness the belt of his loins. Now in this passage of Isaiah 11, the prophet was prophesying ultimately about the Christ. In the Old Testament, you always have the immediate context And you have the messianic promise in many passages. And so as Paul begins to instruct us here in putting on this armor, we're called to understand from the Old Testament that this is divine armor, which belongs to the Lord himself and is given to believers. Again, this is why as we are in Christ, we must secure ourselves in the belts of truth. Remember again what Jesus tells his own disciples in John 14, verse 6. I am the truth. Now also considering the illustration from Paul's day, the clothes that a Roman centurion wore were were really loose and free-flowing. And so the belt, as many of us find in wearing one, just held everything together. And this allowed the soldier to move more freely without obstruction as he fought. And so really we find that this is what truth does for the believer. See, God's revealed truth, truly, properly understood, is like a belt for the believer. It holds everything together. Because to know the truth to sincerely believe the truth and to live according to the truth, that will enable us as believers in how we are to fight in these evil days. But again, to be ignorant of the truth, to be plagued by doubt or hypocrisy will actually lead us to a burdensome existence. And so let me ask you this morning, do you know the truth? Do you know the truth? Do you believe the truth in your heart and seek to live it out? See, many come into the church, they go throughout their lives thinking they know the truth, but they do not truly know. They do not know and believe the truth in Christ. They define truth as relative, open to reinterpretation, while the scriptures define truth as the righteous one himself. See, in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 5, the Hebrew word that is translated as faithfulness can also be rendered as truth or integrity. And this meant that the Christ would walk in the world with perfect integrity according to the truth. Again, we know from the New Testament that he did. Truth was Christ's belt. He revealed the truth to us and he lived according to it always. And so Paul wants us to understand as we are in Christ, 
we are to do the same. We are to be clothed by him and we are to walk as he walked, having on us the belt of truth. And again, Paul continues to tell us that we are to stand. We are to stand having put on the breastplate of righteousness. Now again, notice how each of these pieces is referencing and being referenced as a past tense application. This is not what we need to do. It's what we need to remember has been put on. As we have put on Christ, we have taken up the armor of God. And we need to understand then what that armor is. See, the Christian is far better equipped when he realizes that this is what he needs to remember, not work towards gaining. I think when we begin to make all these lists and think of all these to-dos, we do more damage to ourselves than, than help. See, here again, Paul points us back to the Old Testament, continually putting our mind on Christ. And he points us to the Old Testament in a passage where the Messiah is shown as putting on this divine armor. And so turn with me briefly to Isaiah chapter 59. See, in Isaiah 59, the Lord is pictured as putting on certain things to go into battle. And by showing what clothing he put on, he announces his righteous intention to save and to take vengeance. Uh, in verse 17 of Isaiah 59, we read, He put on righteousness as a breastplate and a helmet of salvation on his head. He put on garments of vengeance for clothing and wrapped himself in zeal as a cloak. Now this, this passage seems to be Paul's primary focus as we find several parallels between Isaiah 59, 17 and Ephesians 6. And I want you to notice that in Isaiah 59, as God promises to bring us salvation, he battles error. He battles unbelief and the very rebellion in our hearts. Friends, this teaches us that God has come in the person and work of Jesus Christ. He put on righteousness as a breastplate and he conquered sin and death, Satan, and even our rebellious hearts. He has come and shown grace to sinners because his justice was satisfied by our Redeemer. And so we are to remember in this that we have taken up the righteousness of Christ that now covers us. See, again, in the illustration of a soldier, if a soldier was, going, was to go into battle without a breastplate, he would quickly die. And the reason for that was because his heart was exposed. His heart was exposed. His vital organs were exposed to every weapon thrown in his direction by his enemy. And so here the Apostle Paul tells us we have put on the breastplate of righteousness. It is a guard against death and the enemy and every unrighteousness. And so this is why it's critical for us to look back to the Old Testament and not first to Roman soldiers. We should understand that this is not something we take on and find our own righteousness in. It is not something that we take up and we think, here's what I have done to withstand. No, this breastplate, as Paul describes it, even pointing back to the Old Testament, is one that is made from the righteousness that belongs to Christ. He alone was without sin and guilt. And he is truly righteous. And so we come now through Christ having his righteousness as our own as we have turned from our sin and believed upon his name. And so in that, it is at that moment, the moment we believe that a great exchange takes place where our sin and our guilt is removed where Christ has paid for those things on the cross and his righteousness is imputed or it is applied to us. Again, this is why we looked at Romans 5 last week when we examined verse 17, where Paul said, For if 
Because of one man's trespass, death reigned through that one man, which is Adam. Much more will those who receive the abundance of grace and the free gift of righteousness reign in life through the one man, Jesus Christ. Now in our passage, Paul is telling us we have put on the righteousness of Christ, which is ours by the grace of God in the receiving of faith. As Paul teaches all throughout his letters, we do not have a breastplate or a covering of our own. No, in fact, we must be clothed in Christ's righteousness to be made right before God. Again, this is another place where we should find great comfort and hope. Because it has never been and it will never be dependent upon our ability to clothe ourselves before God. To, to be perfect in our ways. And so even when our enemy tries to discourage us, reminding us that we are sinners, we may say in our prayers, yes, I was. I was once unlovely and unjust and wretched, wretched as a sinner headed for hell. That is what I was. But in Christ, we may say, as Ephesians 2 tells us, but God. While I was rebellious and headed away from God, he was merciful. In fact, Ephesians 2 says he was rich in mercy. He was abundant in being merciful, and therefore he made us alive with Christ. And so by grace, I am saved. Again, in this, we are clothed in Christ. Again, we should remember that even as I give this example <clears throat> of sometimes when we feel just beat down by the enemy that we battle, by, by discouragement, praying the scriptures is one of the most powerful things ever for the Christian. Again, the living word of God is our greatest weapon. And we'll look at this next week more, but I want you to have it pressed into your minds this morning. If you are in Christ, if you have repented of your sin and believed upon him, God has taken off your filthy garments. That is no longer how he sees you because he has clothed you in Christ's garments of righteousness. And so even if the enemy tries to torment our minds or wreck our faith, we have to remember that we have been forgiven. Why? Because Christ is faithful. See, in this, it always makes me think of Pilgrim's Progress. That story where <clears throat> Christian is going on a pilgrimage. And the great enemy there, Apollyon, comes against Christian to accuse him. And he reminds Christian of his sin and his unfaithfulness to Christ, which is exactly what our enemy does. And John Bunyan knew this when he wrote it. In fact, Revelation 12 tells us he is the accuser of the brethren. But I love the response of Christian in the story. When he tells the enemy in response to his accusations, all this is true. All of what you say is true. And much more which you have left out. But the prince whom I serve and honor is merciful and ready to forgive. Church, sometimes we are in a state of difficulty, in a state of spiritual depression. And, and never should our brothers and sisters come around us and just have that attitude of just get up, just buck up, come on, let's go. But the reality is sometimes we can sit in chains that are not locked. We can sit in cells with the door wide open and we can believe we are defeated when we serve a victorious king. And so despite what the enemy may want us to believe or want us to think, we serve a prince who is merciful and ready to forgive. Again, this is why Paul can ask the question and answer it already in Romans 8, 33. Who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justified. You will not be justified 
by anything you have done or that you will do. You have been justified by God alone in Christ Jesus. And so in our deepest trials and in our toughest battles, we must remember the important truth of the gospel, that it is good news. It is good news that while we were still sinners, wretched and hopeless, while we were dead and rebellious and enemies of God, Christ died for sinners like us. He set us free. He forgave us. And now by grace through faith, we are alive in Christ. Again, this is why Paul, in the very beginning of the book of Ephesians, tells us in chapter 1, verse 7, in Christ... We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, according to the riches of his grace. Church, we must never forget that. And we must never forget that we never outgrow our need for the gospel. We need this truth of Christ in our lives every moment. In fact, I I think that's one of the reasons why Paul outlines in Titus 2 why discipleship is often found in in the older men getting with the younger men and the older women getting with the younger women. Have you ever heard the tormented minds of young men and women? How much they overthink? How much they they think they must put on and work through and do? Uh, Again, you that are older probably know that from your own younger years. Some of the things you've worked through, the ways in which you've wonderfully been reminded of the gospel. And so we need this in, in process, in, in, in relationship with one another, and we need to be reminded ourselves. Again, I think we can so often overthink the gospel. And I don't mean deeply study it. The gospel is deep and wide but it is also simple. And so we really do need that old Sunday school song. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him belong. They are weak, but he is strong. Have you ever heard the last verse of that little song? Which says, Jesus loves me, he will stay close beside me all the way. Thou hast bled and died for me. I will henceforth live for thee. Take comfort in those simple truths, dear Christians. And as you do, remember what Paul says in verse 15. He says, and his shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. Again, as in all scripture, this should first remind us about what is true in Christ and about Christ. See, in Isaiah 52, verse 7, the Lord said of himself, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news, who publishes peace, who brings good news of happiness, who publishes salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Now, this is a wonderful reference to Christ and his first coming. And he would come and preach peace to both Jew and Gentile. Remember, as Isaiah 53 speaks of how Christ was crushed upon the cross, Isaiah 52 is sharing how he is coming to proclaim the gospel of peace. Now, if you remember, Paul had told us this in our study of Ephesians. In Ephesians 2, verse 17, In chapter 2, verse 17, Paul told us, Christ came and preached peace to you who were far off and peace to those who were near. Now here, Paul is likely quoting Isaiah 57. In verse 18 and 19, where the prophet again speaks of how the Christ will come to proclaim peace and save God's people. In verse 18 of Isaiah 57, he says, I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will lead him and restore comfort to him and his mourners, creating the fruit of the lips, peace, peace to the far and to the near, says the Lord, and I will heal him. Friends, the gospel of peace 
the good news that through faith in Christ, we are made right with God. That gospel must be taken up and applied to the feet of believers every day. And so let me ask you, do you wish to stand firm? Do you desire to be grounded and unmovable? See, I think the automatic answer to that is, well, yes, absolutely. Well, then how are you going to go out into the rest of the week? How are you going to go out from here in this moment and from then on to the next week when we gather again? See, I think it's a very noble idea to say we wish to stand firm, but then we don't take up the ordinary means of grace. We remain in a type of isolation, not reaching out to brothers and sisters, not taking up the opportunities of the word and and of the ministry in order to stand firm even together. And so do you wish to stand firm? Do you desire truly to be grounded and immovable? Then do not forget the gospel of peace. We need to together stand firm upon the foundation of this gospel good news. We need to take this good news with us into every situation, every endeavor, every relationship, every thought, and every action. But we must not leave it behind, but stand upon it always. For Christ has come. He has set us free Because he has preached peace to our very souls. See, church, in the following verses, Paul is going to remind us of what to do in all circumstances. And what he's going to start by doing is calling us to take up faith. And so our confidence, our strength, and even our faith we have to remember, is not rooted in anything of ourselves. It is rooted in Christ alone who loved us and gave himself for us. And so, brothers and sisters, remember that you have been clothed in the truth of Christ. And so in that, remember, remember his righteousness. Think on his gospel on the faith of which you have in him and the salvation that is ours together through Christ. Again, in these things, we may go out into this world facing this evil day, knowing that Christ is victorious. And by repenting and believing upon him, we have put on these things. And so really, if we're not in that thinking, And even if we need reminding, the question for us is, are we putting on Christ? This is Paul's urgent call to the churches in Ephesus to put on Christ and remember that we go out in his righteousness and his righteousness alone. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for this morning. And Lord, we pray and ask that <clears throat> that as we go out from here, Lord, we, we ask that you would make us bold. Lord, as the believers even prayed in Acts 4, in the midst of trials, in the midst of rejection, Lord, would you grant your servants boldness to speak. Lord, help us when we are weak. R- remind us of the truth of the gospel when we are wrestling Remind us that even when we do not feel good, that we have good news. God, we give you thanks that you have equipped us in all these things in Christ. And Lord, I pray that in in them, as we seek to be reminded of what it means to put on the full armor of God, God, I pray that it would help us as a church together to stand firm. Lord, I pray that you would keep us from the schemes of the enemy and fix our eyes 
upon the Lord Jesus Christ who loved us and has given himself for us and even now is seated at your right hand interceding for us. God, we thank you and we praise you in all of these things. In Jesus' name, amen.